Okay, I think we're recording now. Um, hello, uh, Zainab, thank you so much for joining our class. Um, my students are going to be uh, excited to hear about your views on global modernisms and institutions. Um, hello, class. Um, here is Zainab Verji, who's uh, going to be our guest for uh, week 12, I believe, of our class. Um, I'm going to just take a brief moment and introduce um, Zainab to you, and then we're going to go into a conversation and interview um, about global modernisms. So Zainab Verji is uh, an artist, art manager, curator, critic, uh, an activist. So she's a woman with many hats. Um, she was born in Kenya and educated in the UK um, and arrived to Canada in the early 1970s where she studied business administration and economics at Simon Fraser University. Um, while in UK, she was deeply engaged in the UK's British black arts. And I think this is really important and third cinema which is connected to our discussion of global, um, of global modernisms and the post Bandung decolonization. And if you remember, we talked about Bandung in the first class, which uh, uh, after that she followed, um, um, she came to Canada where she closely collaborated with some of the Canadian artists such as Ken Lum um, and Sarah Diamond in uh, British Columbia. Um, moreover, Zainab has, uh, was the co-founder and co-director of Invisible Colors in 1989 and later led the Western Front um, Gallery as the executive director throughout the 90s. She then moved to Ontario uh, to work with the Canada Council for the Arts, um, Department of Canadian Heritage, and later she was the inaugural director of the Culture Division at the City of Mississauga. So apart from this long-standing amazing uh, work. She also has a long-standing art practice as a multidisciplinary artist. She's a programmer and curator, as I said, writer, artsman, and administrator. So uh, pretty, pretty outstanding. With over four decades of expertise in cultural policy and cultural diplomacy, which is very important for us, Zainab has con uh, contributed to creation of international and national policy and legislation pertaining to the culture sector, including, I apologize, including um, the international instruments like the status of the artist and cultural, uh, and cultural diversity. Her work on the British Columbia Arts Board led to the formation of British Columbia Arts Council. She has also contributed to the formation of many other institutions. Um, she's an active member of civil society um, and continues to work on issues of artist labor, artist income, racial equity, gender, cultural planning, intellectual property, digital ecosystems of art, cultural institutions, cultural diplomacy and trade. Her work as an artist has been shown at Venice Biennale, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Portland Inst Institute of Contemporary Art, uh, Centre d'Art Contemporain de Basse Normandie, France, um, Museo d'Arte uh, Carillo Gil in Mexico, Faculty of Fine Arts uh, at University of Baroda in India, and Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, she, most importantly, is the laureate of the 2020 Governor General's Visual and Media Arts for Outstanding Contribution for the Arts in Canada. And I am so very happy that you had a little bit of time for us. Thank you so much for this. No, I'd say thank you for um, Boyna, Boyana for inviting me uh, to to engage with you in this conversation. It's really exciting, and um, you know um, that was uh, very nice of you to read that very long <laughs> biography. And um, but you know, I, I think I've been in the field for forty years, so you know it's it's uh, it's always interesting. And we've done really interesting things, you know, I mean, you mentioned Ken Lam and Sarah Diamond. Uh, we were at university together and we were in the same cohort. So we've done lots of um, um, work together. We've been inspired each other. And at all the intersections of work that I've done, you know, it's, it's, um, it's been really exciting in a way because my work has always been looking at, in a way, you know, resistance and, and how to change things. And, and so, um, you know, I thank you for that uh, fantastic introduction. Well, I mean, the kind of uh, multi-dimensional practice that you have deserves an introduction. And I think that 
the view that you will uh, share with us right now comes from that multidimensionality, right? As an artist, as a cultural worker, as someone who has worked on national and international levels, I think you can really speak to the issues that uh, we do in the class. So just to give you a little bit of a background, um, this class used to be a standard survey art history class that covered cl uh, uh, artwork in Canada and United States and, and Western Europe. And um, I took it over and the this is the third time I'm teaching it. And now it has completely turned towards global modernism. So, We've talked uh, from the beginning of the class, the class uh, we've been uh, talking about how artists from different parts of the world, we looked at Africa, we looked at Asia, we looked at Eastern Europe, how they've all responded to different parts of this question of modernism. And a lot of our discussion has come down to infrastructure. So to logistics of did the country have an art gallery? What kind of art galleries were there after colonialism? Um, did the country have uh, art schools? So for example, when we talked about Africa in particular, we really concentrated on Nigeria and we looked at Nigerian art schools and how they negotiated colonialism with art education. So um, I think art institutions uh, are really, really crucial for this idea of decolonization and independent art production. So um, this has been sort of an ongoing question throughout this class. So I'm gonna go into the, my first question, they're quite long, um, but I think it will be good if the students hear it so that they know what we're talking about. So um, I've already mentioned that we've been talking about global modernisms and in our analysis of various aspects of this topic, um, we've been talking about these asynchronous uh, developments of modernism across the world. Um, and as different countries came out of World War II and the colonial era, um, as newly independent and free nations um, and curators, artists, art historians and managers who worked there, they were all grappling with ways in which their particular national artistic production should develop. In most cases, each country was negotiating independent artistic production in relationship to the hegemony of Western modernism and its powerful pull. Establishment of art institutions, building of new national and international art networks and so on were key factors in how each country found its place in international art of the era. So in most cases, these considerations involved important questions of our artistic infrastructure. Uh, creating international artistic networks, negotiating local aesthetic vis-a-vis -vis international modernism. So through your own research and your rich experience as an artist, curator, and art management, how do you define global modernism? And how do you see its implications for art history and especially for contemporary art? Fantastic. Just as you were speaking, it really reminded me of um, Salah Hassan, he said it one time, and then I quote it, you know, what art history should I teach in Khartoum in Sudan? To your point, right? Was there an art gallery? Was there a museum? Was there a policy? So, so speaking to that. Um, so for me, I, you know, I, I, um, I, it's, it's a big, you, you've said a lot in that, in that one point in your one question, but, um, so global modernism for me, it's like a recent addition, right, to the vocabulary with the global turn, implying the market after the Washington Consensus in 1995. And I think globalism is really understood to be like an outcome of the neoliberal globalization of the 90s. And that's sort of how modernism via globalization we see that this like huge, there's a huge onset of homogenization that occurs, right? There's this process that happens. And I think that it's in this homogenization uh, that all the, the erasures occurred, actually, right? So like on the one hand, at a normative level, you've got global modernism, um, you know, might be understood in the context of like the center and periphery relationship. And in that sense, I think global modernism can be understood to reveal um, maybe the agency of the periphery in the creation of that modernity. Um, for example, 
you know, and I'll, I'll talk, to the, talk to this a little bit later, but BNLs were a great example of this, right? Um, how BNLs come into being in the sort of like, and in, 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 in the homogenized occurs around contemporary art. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so I think that there's an imperative of countering, you know, Eurocentric understanding of global history and kind of exposing that, the exploitation, you know, the violence mm -hmm. and even, um, and uneven development that kind of characterizes the modern world, you know? Um, so that's one thing. And then I think the other point uh, that I want to make is the need to distinguish um, modernism in aesthetic terms from the institutionalization process, right? And so what I'm saying is that modern, modernism is just, it's not just an aesthetic term, but it really represents the politics and kind of process of um, institutionalization. So um, let, me, let me try and give a couple of examples to, to try and explain or illustrate anyway what I imply by this, right? Um, for example, the last phase of decolonization, like let's say 70s to 80s, um, comparative literature emerged as the predominant coda for explaining the times through which we see how post-colonial literature was institutionalized under the rubric of modernism, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really big conversation. I'm kind of like paraphrasing a thought here. Um, in a way, it was similar to what high modernists were doing to experimental folks, for example. And there was like this real co-option about around bringing people into the fold so that the periphery was co-opted into the center. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I think when we speak of global modernism, we really need to understand that uh, global modernism renders the sight lines of the West, mm -hmm. right? It is a global term that occurs in modernism. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, that post-95 biennialization of the art world, I think is a perfect example mm -hmm. of this, right? Um, and as a result, you know, contemporary art looks really homogenous. Yes. It's been co-opted, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? Um, and I guess the other point that I want to make, or would like to make, is about intellectual labor. Mm -hmm. And what we see with global modernism is the changing regimes of intellectual labor, mm -hmm. right? So one is that of the artist and the concomitant global divisions inherent in it. And I think the second one is the institutionalization process of art history and kind of, you know, particular aesthetics, often very formalist. And I think this labor has been largely consolidated within the European and US academic institutions or para-academic institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it sort of brings us to the issue of how these intellectual histories um, are anchoring the changing regimes of intellectual labor. Mm -hmm. and, and so really what I'm pointing towards is, the, is like the institutionalization processes of art history and a kind of particular aesthetics, right? Yeah. Um, so, I think that also um, there further there's geographic boundaries of modernism have ex sort of expanded to include the neglected archives of the global south. You know, the idea of development, progress, hence modern, are all part of the West Western vocabulary emerging from post-World War. And by the turn of the century, we see the notion of kind of co-opting ideas of multiple modernities into a global modernism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what, what I, that's sort of how I'm looking at it in a kind of very macro way. I, I'm really interested in what you, how you connected the contemporary moment with the modernism um, of the past. And this is the sort of the rub that I'm really interested in. And I'm going to be exploring it more in my contemporary art class that I'm teaching next winter, uh, next, uh, yeah, next winter. Um, but Absolutely. I think that there is a real co-option, as you say, of the ethos. Um, 
and as with that, an erasure of the people who have been, because I had a, I had very recently, I had a conversation with an art, uh, a curator, not an art critic, but a curator who um, was quite like, was sort of questioning my bringing up um, certain festivals that happen in art biennales that happened before all of this biennialization, you know, in the fifties that were there in the seventies and sixties. And this person said, well, but that's not true. Like those, these festivals, like that's not true. Uh, the first, you know, the first such show is like in the 1980s with all those um, sort of Western uh, shows of the, like the Magicien de la Terre and these sort of Western curated shows. And I said, listen, these curators are coming from the global south or the third world, whatever you want to call it, but nobody knew about them because they were working in their, you know, in their parts of the world and people didn't care in the West. They didn't think about it. Um, but we've got um, sort of bianalization happening in a different way before. It's just that you people in the West didn't write about it. Um, so, you know, and, and I was talking to students how when Sanghor came to power in Senegal, he was very uh, adamant uh, about uh, putting out 25% of the budget of the national budget for, bring, for, bring, uh, for, for building a culture, uh, for cultural development. And that, you know, is unheard of. Like, <laughs> if that much of, of our budget in Canada would be allocated for culture, where would we be? So, um, but this is not as sort of, that's the erasure uh, that, that is talked about. So it's very interesting, this, this sort of how to think about these uh, histories. Um, so let me go on to the second question. Um, mm -hmm. So as we, we've already pointed out that this global modernism is a, is a, is a new term surfacing in Anglo-American art and art history and sort of coming out in the last 10 to 15 years. But the influence of artists like yourself, for example, theorists and art managers uh, from various parts of the world was always present, both on Canadian national scene, but also in the international scene for many decades, and it was unacknowledged. So would you agree with this assessment that this is a case? And if you do, how have such people shaped modernism in your view? So maybe from on your own experience, when you, you know, came to Canada as an immigrant, you know, how did you see this world uh, of Canadian art and, you know, found your way through it? Yeah, you know, I, I think you're, you're, you have a fair assessment. Um, and I, I, do, I will talk about Canada and, and what happened in Canada, but I want to also kind of just kind of look at some examples just sort of in continuation of the, the thoughts earlier. And like, for example, you know, what came to my mind is the Indian um, uh, Triennale in 1968. And I'm gonna quote this, um, if, if you don't mind. The Triennale India, which opened in New Delhi in that fateful year of global upheaval and transition, 1968, was a gesture made in full awareness of its international political import its timing was perfect. A notable achievement in a society otherwise afflicted by cultural time lag and ideological indecisiveness. The Triennale was staged at the height of the war in Vietnam, mm -hmm. which like many of the anti-colonial revolutionary struggles that were underway across Asia and Africa was framed within the Cold War scenario. The genocide in Biafra was in its second year, and the struggle of African Amer Americans for full civil rights in the United States had entered a decisive phase. And most importantly, the Triennale took place in February before the famous student uprisings of Paris, May 68, mm -hmm. end quote. You know, and this, this Triennale um, in, uh, in India it brought together 609 works from 31 countries, right? Uh, and, and Mulk Raj Anand, an Indian writer who was the moving force behind the Triennale, believed, quote, hope, hope for one world culture based on the idea that while local traditions 
may be retained as different flavors, certain universal values may be achieved, end quote. And, and you know, this is really kind of a concurrent scene, even in the message from, you know, John Berger, right? The British, mm -hmm. British left critic to this endeavor. And he write, he quotes, you know, I quote him again, and the ideology of modern European property is inseparable from imperialism. Mm -hmm. The fight against imperialism and all its agencies is thus closely connected with the struggle for a truly modern art. Mm -hmm. I wish you clear sightedness, strength, and courage in your struggle, end quote. So I think that these times and efforts of counterpoints were manifesting in different zones, and I think art was really central to it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think, for example, it's reflected in like the heavy contestation since the 70s and into the 80s towards the making of, you know, the new international information and communication order, mm -hmm. right? And we know how the McBride Commission report was not accepted and it was not allowed to circulate, right? Mm -hmm. And But that report really beautifully captures that spirit which the Triennale represents, the one world, many voices. And I think all of this leads to this tactical media movement, right? The role of video and video art, its impact on feminism, it's, it's, et cetera, it's like just so important what comes out of this, right? And then, you know, um, so we see in Canada, right, is, is well known for its video art, right? And, and the work that's done here. Um, and we see this, you know, the first Asian Biennale in Dhaka in Bangladesh in 1981, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was um, held at the, at, at the, at the Shilpal Kala Academy. And it saw like 14 countries that were participating. Um, so, you know, this is a fascinating, fascinating history of what I call those multiple modernisms, right? And I think this is internationalism at its best, right? Like from the journey from the first Triennale in 68 to the first Asian Art Biennale in 81. So this is like this, this trajectory. And, and this is internationalism at its best. You know, this internationalism is countered by the forces of globalism as the Cold War ends. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like co-opted by a globalization of the market into what we now are calling global modernism. You know? yeah, and I think this is key, what you just said the, from the quote, is the, is the kind of unifying vision that allows for multiplicity within it. Um, and from my own research that, as you know, um, working on Ljubljana Biennale and working on cultural diplomacy around that, that was always the question. It was always, let's have a unified voice, but within that, every culture, every nation, every language has its own space, um, but we proceed sort of in a, in a unified way, which I don't see as happening today, right? Today is just this kind of neoliberal um, uh, cultural um, unity, which unfortunately developed into this. So, um, you know, Alexandria Biennale, Ljubljana Biennale, all these exhibitions, um, India Triennale, they were all sort of have a very similar view. And when you mention uh, media, um, in 1974, non-aligned, uh, I'm going to talk about in my lecture uh, related to what we're talking about uh, on this, a uh, non-aligned movement started their own media company or their own news agency that was heavily protested by the Americans, so much so that they pulled their uh, funding to UNESCO because of it, because UNESCO was a main sponsor of this, because United States hated the fact that there would be this independent news agency that produced counter hegemonic media production. So, um, you know, there, there was forces against this kind of work as well, continually, um, as there were forces, of course, uh, uh, against anti-colonial struggle as well. Um, which kind of leads me to my, I'm gonna skip over the third question because we've already kind of mentioned some of these exhibitions and examples. So I'm gonna go into the fourth question, which I think directly relates to what we're saying. So I'm just going to read the question and then the students will have the quote that I'm using. 
So in addressing what he defined as cultural imperialism, which is what we're talking about, Vietnamese diplomat and academic Tran Van Ding uh, called for a continued work on countering cultural imperialist um, work uh, out there. He quoted a call by Amilcar Cabral to understand cultural liberation and independence as an integral part of decolonization. And the quote is, certainly imperialist domination calls forth cultural oppression and attempts either directly or indirectly to do away with the most important element of the culture of the subject of people. But the people are only able to cr create and develop the liberation movement because they keep their culture alive and uh, alive despite the continual and organized repression of their cultural life. And because they continue to resist culturally, even when their political and military resistance is destroyed. And it is cultural resistance, which is at a given moment, uh, at, at a given moment can take on new forms, political, economic, army to fight foreign domination, uh, end quote. So following these important words, many cultural workers have use culture and cultural diplomacy to fight forms of imperialism. Do you see the need for continued work to do so in this globalized uh, world of today? Um, and if there is a need, how do you see this work today to be different than let's say in the 20th century uh, when Cabral and Van Dijk were writing this? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yes, I mean, I do see the need for continued work. Um, in this respect today for sure. I mean, you know, the, today the idea of cultural diplomacy has been like so neoliberalized. We, we, you've talked about that. It's really become a tool which is euphemistically called soft power. Yes. But there is really a conceptual discontent of this term cultural diplomacy. And I think cultural agencies are really using this more in terms of like building audiences, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think that's kind of the level of instrumentalization that's occurred. And um, though, the so though the soft power rhetoric was initiated in the 80s and it, it, it consolidated with the 1990s after Kofi Annan at the United Nations kind of really instrumentalized cultural diplomacy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that more importantly, the terms such as cultural diplomacy, cultural relations, public diplomacy, soft power, they create a certain kind of ambivalence in the semantic constellation at play. And um, the saliency that these terms gather, and I think that the import of the actions hinged on their meaning mm -hmm. can create really confusing, um, or rather kind of confusing terrain that I think highlight, highlights kind of this mismatch between overblown rhetoric mm -hmm. and the ground realities, mm -hmm. um, as much as the institutional location of cultural diplomacy, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, that there's this problem with the very modernist framework uh, of the study of international relations, which gives primacy to the nation state and its security, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So neither neither religion or culture or even science and technology um, are not taken into that envelope of cultural diplomacy, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I think that they've not been given any space, even within the dominant sort of realist, neorealist schools, mm -hmm. which kind of peddled a particular understanding of diplomacy, you know, and foreign policy and international relations. So I think though you know, kind of despite this kind of growing insertion of cultural identity and art as, a, as issue areas in the study of international relations, art institutions, exhibition making, art movements, networks, art events, festivals, uh, I think are some of the most understudied areas within, within the study of international relations. Um, and I think that with the rise of constructivism, in the study of also IR, there's also kind of this newfound appetite for bringing into its fold those these very actors and their agencies, right? Um, and maybe this enables new areas of study to open up, mm -hmm. but as well as foster kind of the strengthening of the discipline, I think, in the 21st century, you know? Um, and, and I guess in this respect, what Car Cabral and Van Dijn talked about 
becomes really critical. You know, in simple terms, it's this connection between cultural diplomacy and resistance that has to be made, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of how, how I am with that. It seems that also within this process that you say started in the 80s and really um, uh, ossified these prop, the, these kinds of uh, uh, movements in, in culture internationally, um, have sort of take, taken out the politics out of it, right? In many ways, it has become this sort of managerial thing rather than a political liberation thing. Um, and the questions of liberation and structural change, not just in uh, politics, but also international art in the functioning of not international art have been sort of completely, um, completely depoliticized to, to, to its detriment, I believe, um, where now we're mostly, now, as you, as, as you said, and as we talked about, under this neoliberal cultural um, form um, that's now everywhere from New Delhi to, you know, Paris to Toronto, um, there is a kind of a talk about identity and talk about cultural, you know, um, uh, celebration of culture, whatever it is, but really, there is nothing that structurally changes the kind of logistics of art world that's still much under capitalism and under kind of the rule of the neoliberalism. Would you, I don't know if you would agree with that, but I suspect Absolutely. you would. Absolutely, because when that turn happened towards that journalism, everything, uh, it literally just took away agency, right? It, it demobilized us we didn't know even how to respond to it mm -hmm. and and we're still in it right i think um i think that people um are unable to to gather in a way to respond in the ways that we need to right because it's so heavy uh on us and i don't think i think part of it was that you know it was like we were sort of co-opted into it and this really um kind of interesting way well not interesting but in a way that we we just all, all agency was you know kind of ripped out mm -hmm. right there was just no way to respond um so uh, no i totally agree with you there so i think we're gonna ha I, I was i just had my grad seminar this morning and we were discussing this issue of art and uh, artists role in society and where is the sort of future and um, until the structure of art is radically transformed, but radically on an institutional way, and not just art, academia and all these other places, all of these talks around inclusiveness and all this other stuff is just, is just a mask that hides the real problem. So um, it's a really, it's a really um, uh, big issue. And I think lots of younger artists and younger, uh, people are are now learning about it, which is good. Um, but but I think that these sort of histories of the 20th century and what people have done under the yoke of colonialism, because when we talked about earlier, for example, in earlier classes, we talked about how even before decolonization, for example, in certain countries in Africa, like in Egypt or in Nigeria, um, people were already sort of negotiating how they would get out of colonialism and build art infrastructure. So those kinds of uh, very brave and very like um, uh, difficult things that people have done could be something to look up to and maybe imagine new ways of getting out of this, uh, how should I say, under the yoke of neoliberalism that we're on, under right now. Um, so that's all my questions. I don't want to uh, bug you too much. I think this conversation can go on for a lot longer. Um, but for this class that we're, where we're discussing international exhibitions um, and biennales in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, I think it was really important to talk about the infrastructure and the things that you've said. So, um, and how it connects yeah. to today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, uh, no, 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 thank you for asking me. I, I also really feel like it's important to note like the role 
or what's happened also in Canada, you know, around these yes, things. Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of, I mean, you talked about Africa and, and kind of what we, we see it in literature, we see it, you know, with like um, the kind of amazing literature that came out of Africa that was like really trying to counter exactly all of these things and like break out of it. But I just wanted to like sort of mention, for example, you know, how important Vancouver was and it really played this like really important role in addressing the crisis of modernity mm -hmm. as the 70s echoed. I had, I don't know, you might know this book, right? Modern, do you know this book? Yes, uh, I think, yes. Uh, we have it, conference. Yes, we have it at, the, at our library, in our fine arts library. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll give you a quote on that, like Benjamin um, Bucklow aptly puts it and he goes, the Vancouver Conference on Modernism was in fact one of the more productive steps in that reflection process on the validity of modernism's concepts, as well as in the critical investigation of the various claims for its demise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the latent interest in accelerating that event, as well as an attempt to verify the validity of the concept of postmodernism that was supposedly, you know, to replace it, right? Mm -hmm, yes. Um, and it, it was really a response um, as part of that New York Paris access, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I think this conference also resonated really well in the, um, in the Primitivism 1984 exhibition at MoMA, New York, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know you 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 see in '84 also in Art Forum International, there's a review essay titled "Doctor Lawyer Indian Chief." Are you aware of this one? I think I've heard about it, but I don't think I've read it. But I've I've, I've heard the the title of it. Uh, yeah, it was um, Thomas McEvilly uh, okay. that wrote, and he he puts by the late seventies, the dogma of universal aesthetic feeling was again threatened mm -hmm, mm -hmm. under the influence of the Frankfurt thinkers and of postmodern relativism. The absolutist view of formalist modernism was losing ground. Mm -hmm. Whereas its aesthetics had been seen as higher criteria by which other styles were to be judged now, were mm -hmm. to be judged now in quite respectable quarters, they begin to appear as just another style, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it goes on, so for a while, like re, pre raphaelitism or the Ashkan school, they had served certain needs and exercised hegemony those needs those needs passing their hegemony was passing also mm -hmm. but the collection of the museum of modern art is predominantly based on the idea that formalist modernism will never pass will never lose its self-validating power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not a relative condition thing subject to transient cause and effects it is to be about the web of natural and cultural change it mm -hmm. this is its supposed its supposed essence and after several years of sustained attack such a credo needs a defender and a new defense how brilliant to attempt to revalidate classical modernist aesthetics by stepping outside their usual realm of discourse and bringing to bear upon them a vast foreign sector of the world by demonstrating that the innocent creativity of primitives naturally expresses a modernist aesthetic feeling Mm -hmm. one may seem to have demonstrated once again that modernism itself is both innocent and universal sorry i know that's like a really long quote uh, i'll provide actually i'm going to find that quote and i'll provide it for the i can send it to you oh that would be great I, I, that would be i wonderful. can send you yeah. okay that's great because i think it's in a very important quote it also speaks to the deep misunderstanding of modernisms outside <laughs> because right from the get-go everyone who was coming in touch with modernism who was you know from other parts of the world was immediately wrestling with what do we do with this like do we do we accept it do we not so these questions of the legitimacy of modernism were already in the 30s being uh, addressed by artists outside of the west because you just have to do it if you're outside of that normative hegemony you you have to address it and question vis-a-vis -vis your own tradition 
Um, so yeah. that there's a there's a really uh, big gap in understanding and knowledge about what that meant in the 80s. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know you can see this um, in the 1984. And you mentioned this already earlier. Was the 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 exhibition in Paris, right? The Magician de la Terre was a, as a response to yeah. this, right? Yeah. Um, because it kind of ushers in that far-reaching international exhibition style, and that really, which really only came into its own in the context of neoliberal globalization of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and um, you know, um, and I think prior to 1989, an international exhibition meant U.S. artists and a handful of Germans. Yes. <laughs> so, Paris, so Paris was really keen to take up this torch. And a couple of Japanese, and a couple of Japanese. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, st you know so it, it, it kind of wanted to take up this torch of modern art, right? Yeah. Stolen, yeah. as it had been by New York, right? After the yeah. Second World War. And so yeah. decided to kind of invest in this ambitious exhibition, kind of divided between these two venues, right? The, yeah. the Halle de la Villette and the Centre Pompidou. Right. And, and you know, I, I've in my own work, I've done sort of bean counting in some ways where I compared Ljubljana Biennale with um, that I'm studying and I'm going to talk to my students about and Documenta that started in exactly the same year and Alexandria Biennale started in the same year. And so by 1970s, 70% 70 of Ljubljana Biennale artists were coming from non-Western, like Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa. Um, and then in, uh, in Documenta, that is now this, the grand sort of, you know, big contemporary art exhibition, they had like four or five artists. <laughs> they had some uh, Japanese, they had, I believe, an uh, artist from Iran, and they had a couple women. But this is 1970s, so, um, you know, they were coming to this quite late, and uh, this was discovered by the West, as you say, only in, um, in the 80s and late 80s and into the 90s. So um, we need to, we need to really bring up these histories that were, you know, international um, way before that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think that there was that other exhibition in 1954, right? Family Man mm -hmm. at MoMA in New York. Um, and, and so it's really understand, important to see these three, kind of the primitivism, magician de la terre and the family of man to really, kind of, family of man, to kind of understand what was really happening here, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and in Vancouver again, interestingly, I bring up Vancouver because I, not only did I live there, but you know, there were two really seminal events that occurred there. One was Beyond History, Mm -hmm. And the other one, uh, it was at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and the other one, obviously, Invisible Colors, which was, you know, something that um, I founded, co-founded. Um, you know, I, I, I think also there was things like um, the institutionalization of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. this was like a direct in intervention into that modernist debate. and it really tried to foreground new vernaculars, right? Um, like, you know, third world modernism was the nomenclature, right? Used mm -hmm. by architect, mm -hmm. architects, right? Yes. And, and, and I think a lot of my work, so that, art, that award for architecture was founded in 1977, mm -hmm. right? And then I think in the Canadian context, it's really important also to mention the Massey Lavec report, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, yeah. it kind of it offered this whole new kind of armature to the idea of modernism, and it really created that Eurocentric ideal of culture mm -hmm. as the central plank around which institutions came up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I've spoken a lot about this, and you know, you can read my essay, "The Great Canadian Amnesia in Canadian Art," for example. So yeah, and I'll send you that quote for sure. Perfect. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a very quick question. In your view, when you have, when you, uh, when the Invisible Colors came in, which is 1989, what was the reception? Like, what, what, from that perspective, from the perspective of the time when it happened, like, did, what were your views and the perspective of, and reception of the others? 
Um, sorry, can you just repeat the last yeah, part? I, I, I was just interested to know from your own sort of personal perspective, how did you, what was the, what was your, how did you feel about when it came out and how was the reception from the art world at the time and how, what was the, what were the views on, on the exhibition? What, what happened on the, on the, what, what you did? Right. That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, Invisible Colors uh, was in the making for a couple of years, at least before that, but I would say longer. It's just that we were able to, to come together to make it happen in that moment in time. One, because in 1989, they, they, it was like, Invisible Colors actually comes out of a much longer history of, of third world feminism and the third eye and all the work that had happened in Britain. And I think in Vancouver, Hoover, um, you know, we had already been been talking about all of these the, these things, and and I think when we were able to, you know, bring such a huge international event right um, together in a place like Vancouver, um, the Canadian, I would say, the Canadian art world or the Canadian media art world, let's put it this way. Okay. We're, we're able to respond in a phenomenal way. And, and in a way, I think it, it, it was really about, you know, for the first time internationally that such an event had occurred. Mm -hmm. So I think there was like, the, it was caught in that, you know, um, the first time that women from the first world and women from the third world were coming together to talk about the issues of production and, and access and, what was happening in their national cinemas and what was the place of gender in it. And I, I think it opened up this kind of space. And because it was so successful, the art world then took notice. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I won't say the art world was supporting it. Yes. Until it became, it was so successful. And then the art world took notice. Mm -hmm. But it was this work which led to, you know, policy change at the Canada Council for the Arts. Mm -hmm. You know, it pushed for the creation of a racial equity office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist anymore there. Yeah. We don't need that right now. There's we no we need don't need that. that thing anymore, right? Um, so, so, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, and, and it, it was kind of, it was also done in conjunction. The partner was the National Film Board. Yes. So it was this really kind of interesting moment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but outside world, you know, outside, when I say outside world, I mean non-art world, did it take, and how kind of, what was the, was there any uh, reaction to it? And you would say, yes, there was, okay. Okay, so. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know, do you know this? Are you familiar with this? Third world women and nope. the politics of being other. No. Nope. Anyway, I, I think that that all over there was a huge because uh, you know we we brought work from Cuba, we brought work, work, yeah. work from Chile, we brought brought work from Japan and China. But you imagine we were all over from Africa. So I think that it was the first time that people felt that there were like some very conversations that were not possible before mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. because even within their own national cinemas and their own national context you know people couldn't readily talk about things mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. right yeah. so i think that that had repercussions back to their own countries as well yeah so um with this great example of uh of uh, exhibition I think we're, we can will end because uh, we've been talking for about an hour and I don't want to take your time um, but I did uh, you know I did want to say how much how important it is and in my lecture I will be connecting this sort of thread uh, that starts in the 19 because this sort of, this is our um, this will be our last lecture of the semester and I think that what you've done with that exhibition really, and with this whole event around Invisible uh, Colors, really connects to everything else that we've been talking about throughout and really sort of connects the, 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 the biennials and exhibitions and festivals uh, throughout the sort of throughout the uh, mid 20th century 
and then how it in 1989, which is in itself a very important year, um, sort of what happens with with what you were doing, and also in the country that's largely been outside or on the sidelines of this world, right? Even uh, even though it's in the West, so um, we'll we'll make those connections as well in the lecture. So um, thank you so much um, for for this interview and for your experience and uh and i'll uh, share the i'll share the quotes that you provided with the students so they can read um what, what you were saying i'm just going to stop the uh